amazing. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you, SIR, for the honor of being part of the series of wonderful lectures that you've done for years and years. This is really fantastic um, that there's so much interest in Chaco. I think some of it is due to the danger to Chaco and people being so alert to that, which is great. But I know you also have a range of interests from wanting to know more of the technology, which we will bring to you tonight, wanting to know a little more of the astronomy and what the layers of our findings have been with that. So that's basically where we're going to go. Um, let me say more about Rich and Ron. Rich I've worked with, I've known him 25 years at least, and Rich is an incredible innovator with GIS and with technologies for Chonko. He's just <laughs> decades of help. Anyway, we were just talking about LIDAR and I said, you have an image from 07, how early you were? He said, no, I started in 01. <laughs> so this, and now LIDAR is the rage in archaeology. So this is just one illustration of, of where the innovation is so fantastic with Rich. Plus, he has this unique combination which we have with no other colleagues, which is that Rich can see on the ground through his geology and archaeology background and what decades out there in the <coughs> desert, he will see the mi most minute detail and the most subtle details. So it's, it's been fantastic working with him. And Rob, we've worked for off and on for four years, pretty steadily for six intense months <laughs> that were unbelievable when he had just finished Brown. Now he's going on to his PhD, as you heard, at, at Boulder, with a focus on roads, which is very exciting. He's truly the future for working with all of us um, together. It's very exciting. So they will be part of this presentation, and we have little time, so we're going to go pretty fast. Um, let me just ask before we start, how many people have been to Chaco? <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I almost think nobody hasn't. <laughs> um, how, how many people have seen the mystery of Chaco Canyon? At the, the PBS, they call it the Redford film. Yeah, great. Well then, I, that helps me. But I won't, I'll try not to be repetitive. This one? Okay. And you're going to sit here wrong. Yep. Okay. Um, so you've all seen the title of the talk, and we're going to be expansive and also detailed. <laughs> I hope we can squeeze it all in. Um, we're going to start with thinking and talking about what was the center of Chaco Canyon. So I'm going to start with a, an animation that's going to take you into the center of Chaco. Can, are you doing the slides? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, because the question is um, why they would develop on such a monumental scale as you've seen in Chaco and as you move in through the landscape in Google Earth. What stands out is the aridness of the center of Chaco, the basin itself, San Juan Basin, 35,000 square miles, and then to find Pueblo Benito in that extraordinary expanse um, and in the very most challenging canyon you can imagine, as Rich has taught me, that, for instance, the growing season is extremely short, the soil is not great. There is a debate about how much had to be imported, but certainly a good deal of the food was brought in from 50, 60 miles away. Um, you can see here that the monumental scale is set within that arid landscape. And the timbers in the buildings, 240,000, were brought mostly from the Chuska Mountains, 55 miles to the west. The question is, why didn't they settle there, make that the Nile Valley, the, the more uh, productive landscape? And instead, they chose Chaco, um, and it, on a very grandiose scale. And you'll see this in Rich's uh, model. This is his work. In, in uh, five stages over three centuries, this is the final stage, and you see that tiny figure, the little black, looks like an ant to give you a sense of how huge the buildings are. And that's what our modeling is, is really trying to get across to people, 
So they understand the grandiosity that was achieved and the, the effort of the landscape work like this. Here in the center, it's not just that you had um, individual buildings um, in, in that packed into the center, but that they had roads, sometimes connecting building to building and often going up the cliffs. Can you show that road? You've got the pointer. Um, the, uh, you've been to Chaco, you've seen these cliffs are like 50 to 70 feet high, sometimes higher. And look at how many rampways and ways and how many different, it's like an arterial system. And then once you get to the top, we'll show it later, you have a great number of roads you see up at Alto, and this will be something Rich will show more of. Um, let's go uh, forward. And so Chaco is the center, too. I think people are not fully aware of how huge expanse. The red dot up on the left side up there is Lowry Ruin. Um, or no, actually, we changed that. That's Edge of Cedars. That's the furthest to the north. And it's in Utah. And then you see one over to the right in southwestern Colorado. That's Chimney Rock that many of you know for its famous lunar alignment. And way south, uh, down below Zuni, you have sites. And then Guadalupe near Cuba. And far, far to the west, an extraordinary distance from Chaco, uh, near Wapatki, near Flagstaff. These are great houses. And every yellow dot you see there, we think now about 150 great houses. Um, and and they, uh, they replicate what we see in the center. Uh, do you see the, the building over? This is uh, Pueblo de la Royal, which many of you visited. That's the second or the third place that gets so visited. You could take a section of the building, maybe there to the left side, um, and that's what you would find out in the hinterlands, in these great houses, about a third the size of one of these massive buildings, or maybe a fifth the size. But if you can imagine that, and that's our challenge, how can we get people to understand, for instance, the rules of architecture that we're bonding people to, the same, the same expression architecturally, the house squared off Kiva structure, the, the geometric rigor, those grids. And now we've found similar proportions in the 14 largest buildings in the geometric shapes. Um, and then how large the rooms are. We've d done this work out at Pintado and found that um, a typical room is, is six or eight times the size of a unit Pueblo room. And um, that's what's so fascinating. How did this happen? <laughs> people were living in this really more simple and more um, related to the earth in smaller units, not coordinated across this huge space and not building monumentally. And then suddenly, it seems quite sudden, you get these huge buildings like this. This is uh, Kinbiniola. This is about 12 miles to the southwest of the canyon. And that back wall that you see that's almost as long as the wall, the front wall of Pueblo Benito. So when you're closer to the canyon, you get this monumental scale, even in the, in the outliers. And we have a model of this, which is kind of useful. There's very typically, and you may have seen this in the Benito um, 3D model, there's a narrow entrance. When you walk into Benito, they now have a, lar a large one to the right of the central wall. You know, it's about six or eight feet across. That's not the original entrance. That was walled across. The entrance that was used by the Chacoans is to the west side of that central wall. And it's like this one. I think we have it. You see? And that is so typical. So it's like you're entering an inner sanctum through this very small passageway. And the other thing to note here, um, well, in all the buildings, is most, many of the buildings, there's the build-up that Rich has taught me is marvelous insights as a geologist, that enormous amounts of earth are at the foundation of Chetra Kennel, 15, 20 feet, uh, Pueblo Benito, sites of the outliers, um, where enormous earth is moved and flattened to create the base of these, these buildings. And these are the things we don't easily see when we go to a ruin. Um, so here we're going to show you that what we saw in the center with the great house 
uh, with a, a complex of great houses in what we call downtown Chaco. You cross 15 miles to the southwest, very spare landscape, no great houses on your way, and you come to this. Um, and you can see it looks almost like, it's odd, what is this doing in the middle of this uh, kind of empty place, 15 miles away from the center? But we did uh, first a wireframe model, so you get a sense of the complexity of the rooms. And then we moved it into an animation to give you a sense of coming in and what a person might experience coming into, the, again, that narrow doorway, enclosed typically by a flat space, a kind of plaza space, and also putting our little figures there so you could see the monumentality of the site. And the fine work, the beautiful masonry in all of these sites, which is also common across the landscape. Um, and now we're gonna move across the landscape again, this time to the southwest, to uh, Navajo Springs, 120 miles. And look how tough that, <laughs> that region is. Not, doesn't look very inviting, it looks very uh, non-productive to, to my eyes. And yet, here is a typical um, outlier, and it's called Navajo Springs. And we're gonna show you now what it was like to come here and what uh, these roads were like. So typically, just the, the way you saw at Pueblo Alto in the center, that a, no, a number of roads would relate to a building. You have those spokes. And now we're taking you in on somewhat the ground level of a person. Yeah, um, so that's a typical experience of a road, or what we're trying to get with better animation is to engage people in almost a virtual reality where you enter inside that monumentality um, and really experience it. And now I'm gonna ask Rob to talk about what he's found, which is a very, very interesting um, impact of the Mesoamerican connection. Thank you. <clears throat> So I'd just like to say thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you to SAR for having us. It is truly an honor to be here presenting in my hometown and also alongside two amazing mentors and colleagues who have taught me so much. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my research which I would say has focused on some of the important activities or practices that were going on at Chaco Canyon related to this question of what was it that gave this place such a magnetic power that drew people to, you know, provide labor and other resources for the construction and maintenance of this, the largest monumental center the Southwest has ever seen. So two things I'll focus on are the goods that were imported to Chaco Canyon from different regions of Mesoamerica, which we call exotica, goods with really sort of striking properties, the likes of which people in the ancient Southwest never would have experienced, which are quite a shock if you think about that. And I'll touch a little bit on practices of gaming and gambling as well. So, oh, I, my macaws went away. But one of the most you know, striking and interesting of these goods were scarlet macaws, which came up from you know, the jungles of Mexico, Mesoamerica. So what's so interesting about these birds? Well, certainly one, as a person at Chaco Canyon, you never would have seen a creature like this. It's coming from far away, and we know that in most societies, ours included, and traditional societies around the world, places that are far away are always associated with a greater degree of sort of spiritual power, so that physical distance equals supernatural distance. So we know these things, people would be thinking, these things are coming from far away, and what else? Well, they are multiple colors. In fact, they are six colors. We know that indigenous peoples of the Southwest and all throughout the Americas associate the cardinal directions as well as up and down with colors. We call it color directional symbolism. Uh, what are those colors of the cardinals? Red, yellow, blue, and green. What about up and down? White and black. So you have all the colors that you've associated to the world around you, embodied here in this single bird, coming from this mystically distant land, and furthermore, it can talk to you. 
And it, it's a little silly, but this is truly, uh, you know, something enchanting and wonderful if you've never experienced it before, and then you are a person coming to Chaco Canyon, perhaps periodically to participate in ceremonies, observances, or rituals, and, you know, these birds are pretty restricted just to Chaco. So I think of this as, you know, something wondrous that, that makes you really think about who are the people in control of Chaco. Um, this is another example of a good for Mesoamerica would be cacao beverages, so that's chocolate. So for many years, scholars noted a formal resemblance between these cylindrical vessels that were found at Pueblo Benito. They were mostly cached in a single room uh, in the oldest section of Pueblo Benito, and um, Maya cylindrical vases, although this form is fairly common throughout different Mesoamerican societies. Um, you know, unlike in Chaco, where we have no written texts, among the Maya, of course, there are hieroglyphs that can be read. And what did they say on a lot of these cylindrical vessels? Kakawa, which those of us in Santa Fe go get a chocolate drink sometimes at the shop. So in uh, 2009, fantastic research from Dr. Patty Crown at University of New Mexico showed that indeed there was the chemical residue of chocolate in these Chaco and cylinder vessels. So people are also consuming these beverages. It's something you never would have tasted before. We sometimes forget, but especially in its purest form, in its highly concentrated form, cacao is a powerful stimulant. So you have a new taste, a new mental state coming from this far distant place. And these were very restricted. We saw they're only really kept in one section of Pueblo Benito. So I think of this as another one of these, you know, powerful and wondrous um, experiences that, that Chaco provided to people with this special allure. Oops. Another aspect of the gatherings at Chaco would have certainly been sound. Uh, what you see at the top is a section of the cliffs between Pueblo Benito and Chetra Kettle that is, you know, naturally curved but was substantially altered by the removal of a great deal of rock to create an amazing amphitheater that has certain acoustical properties, um, creates a standing wave. It's been compared to sort of, you know, equivalent acoustics to Carnegie Hall. And that would have been, I'm sure, an amazing area where, you know, if you can imagine dances, songs, performances taking place. And of course, we found important instruments in the buildings of Chaco as well. Conch shell trumpets, again, something coming up from very far away from the Mexico and from the lands of the ocean. Bells made of copper. I mean, you never would have seen metal. You never would have heard that sort of a tinkling sound. We know that often that sound among you know, native peoples of ancient Mexico or the Southwest related to the sounds of rain and fertility. And then of course flutes as well with um, often uh, depictions of watery creatures on them. So we can think about sort of bringing the people into Chaco and these, you know, what were some of the elements of the experiences that were so compelling to people to bring this energy into these monumental buildings. I won't spend too long on this, but a final aspect that I've conducted research on, so my master's thesis at Brown University, was about the practices of gambling and gaming at Chaco Canyon. So there are a number of native oral traditions, both from Pueblo people and Diné or Navajo people, that describe um, lots of gambling practices happening in Chaco, not the way we think of as sort of a recreational leisure activity, but in Native American societies and groups around the world. Gambling has many different functions. It's often a way for people to trade things, bring groups together and sort of break the ice. It often has what in our terms we would call religious connotations related to the unknown and divining or unpredictability. So these are just some pictures of, I brought together all the previously excavated pieces. These things have been sitting in drawers in New York for the last hundred years. And there's around 500 distinct gaming artifacts that came from the buildings at Chaco Canyon. These are different types of dice, carved from bones, some wooden pieces used in a hand guessing game or maybe in kick stick races, and finally these um, long sticks that appear, um, they show a lot of similarity to um, pieces used in, in Pueblos in historic times and today to play a sort of field hockey game called shinny that has many um, important associations. So these, these sort of practices of gaming and gambling, I think, are another important um, aspect of what Chaco was doing for people, drawing people in, and how participants in the ceremonies and gatherings at that place um, sort of experienced something quite novel 
and special and a taste of something beyond just the everyday. And there were certainly many other aspects of what they experienced um, ceremonially, which I will let Anna talk about now. Thank you. Ooh. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> Guess I can hold that. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, so Rob has been very innovative in looking and thinking about um, what would be the experience of people a thousand years ago. And as he gets into that about Mesoamerica, it, it makes me think about the connections I've felt for years. That, um, In fact, I went to Mexico and saw Chichen Itza, Palenque, several sites, uh, Teotihuacan, before I came to Chaco. So that I was just interested as a person like you're interested here tonight to, to learn. But I now return to that base of knowledge thinking not only were the objects there coming from Mesoamerica, the knowledge and the um, expertise, the drive, the passion to create monumental structures, especially in relationship to astronomy. So what I'm going to do here, I, I will go through quite quickly because most of you have seen this on the film, The Mystery of Chaco Canyon, and we don't want to have to hang out there too long, but then go to what the new findings have suggested of astronomy in the bigger region. So atop Fajada Butte, you can show the site there, um, that's the 500 foot butte, and it certainly is striking as you come into Chaco. And there you see the slabs uh, located near the top, sheltered actually by that cliff that's there. And the slabs, those two openings give you, I know many of you know this, but the markings of summer solstice uh, through the right hand slab. Um, and then, do you, do you have, yeah. So the summer solstice light dagger. And I came upon that, I was so fortunate to come there about seven days from solstice, and it was very close to the center, and I was near noon. And then, because I had this little bit of background from being um, at sites at times of astronomical alignment in Mesoamerica, this made sense. And maybe it was fortunate I didn't know enough to say it didn't make sense. <laughs> and um, the imagery was so powerful of the dagger right through the center at that time. And then I joined up with uh, Rolf Sinclair, an astronomer, a physicist uh, with an astronomy background, and then Leroy Doggett, with a, uh, who was editor of the Nautical Almanac. And with these partners, plus an architect trained in Germany in shadow and light formation, we went on to document and published eventually in Science Magazine and other um, peer-reviewed journals. So Equinox, a little dagger of light through that spiral up on the left, and then winter solstice, with now both openings giving you a framing of the center of the uh, spiral. So the light is empty in the center, but out on the edges of winter solstice. Now, those very same positions, the center has the moon, as it rises, and not everybody gets this cycle, it takes quite a while to get into it, but the moon has an 18 and a half year cycle where at certain years it goes no further north than this, and it's called the minor standstill, and that's when the shadow comes through, and it is aligned with that pecked groove, which also seems to emphasize it. And then, nine and a half years later, as it crosses nine and a half turns on the spiral, it's on the left edge of the spiral. And again, with a little uh, groove on that edge. Um, what's really key about this site, and Joseph Campbell said it, but before that, in my meetings with Alfonso Ortiz, the Tewa um, anthropologist, um, he, it was so wonderful. We met in a dark room showing these slides so that he immediately responded in his associations. And he said, where the sun is so marked, so would be the moon. And this was, we were beginning to think a little about the moon, but we weren't really on to it. But that was very encouraging. And the point is, what he's saying is that the sun and the moon would be married. And if you, you understand that little of the Pluto cosmology, the joining of mother moon and father sun, the marriage of the two is very powerful and very important. And that's what we found in other aspects of the site of, of Chaco where for the very same positions of the sun and the moon, 
when we had the opportunity with the National Geodetic Survey, the best surveyors in the world at that time, to see what the orientations of the back walls and the perpendiculars of those wall buildings were, they come out again and again to be to those parts of the cycle of the sun and the moon, the solstices, the equinoxes, and the lunar extremes. And that, um, we have some quick photos, but the, back, the front wall of Benito, that wall, 500 foot wall, half of that is exactly on to the equinox sunset or the equinox sunrise. And if we were standing along that wall, right, uh, Rob will show you, that's what you'd see. Many of you may have been there at Equinox. It's nicely aligned. And also of great interest, that mid wall is so precisely north-south that exactly the uh, middle of the solar passage, the meridian passage for the sun, there is no shadow, shadow on that wall. So we have this integration of the middle of the year with the equinox alignment in the main wall, the front wall, and then the middle of the year. So the daily and yearly cycles are brought together there. And then we have the cardinal organization of the center. So just exactly west of, of Benito, we have the center of Chetrakel. And by the way, that's a lunar uh, oriented building. So again, joining sun and moon. And then it's very low, it's down in the canyon. They're integrating the low and the high, the, the, on the vertical axis as well as the horizontal. Because here we have Pueblo Alto, I bet many of you have been there. And that looks across on a north-south alignment, in alignment with the building walls, to Sinclatsic, which is behind us, or at the bottom of this, off the screen. Uh, precisely dividing that center line, east-west line. So they were organizing building to building in a, in a regional plan. Um, and then we go, if we went 65 miles north to Aztec ruin, we have an alignment at, at solstice. This is the winter solstice set. And the moon, so Chatter Kettle, in that back wall, um, if you stood there, the night of the minor standstill, uh, southern minor standstill set, you'd see the wall aligned to the moon. And if we are at, um, we have a little animation here that shows uh, Penasco, yeah? Oh, maybe not. Oh. So, um, have, have many, I bet many of you have been two and a half miles uh, further northwest and you're up at uh, Penasco, that crescent building. And it has an alignment to the moon, which got a little washed out. But if we took, if you show the um, line across, um, the orientation of the building uh, from our survey with the National Geode Geode Geodetic Survey, um, the perpendicular of that building, that axis is to the moon. And see how it also appears to be down the trajectory of the canyon. So that raises the question, is this part of why the Chaco people were so involved with the moon? Is this is part of the draw to the place to join the sun and the moon? The center has a marvelous feeling of the sun being the central organizing factor for the center. But here we have for this diagonal, the moon's alignment. And this is the furthest south the moon in that 18 to 19 year cycle rises. And very similarly, and I bet a lot of you have been there, if we went way up 92 miles north of Chaco into the southern Rockies, we're at Chimney Rock in Pagosa Springs. And there, and this is Adriel Heise's wonderful aerial imagery, um, if you were there in that year, and it was 06 that Adriel caught this photo, um, where the moon rises between the chimney rocks. And Steve Luxon and some others have done tree ring dating at the building. Three tree ring dates, three times that the building was built and rebuilt, were on the dates of the event of this standstill, which kind of locks it in as not a coincidence. And curiously, just quickly, the uh, back wall of that building is to the winter solstice, the, sorry, summer solstice rise and winter solstice set. And so you have, again, the joining of sun and moon. Now, that use of topography can take us much further. And I'll, I'll skip this for now, but let you know that we will be visiting Bears Ears at the end here. And I think now we have, oh, I'm going to do this very quickly. 
um, because Rich, we want to hear from Rich soon. Uh, but roads, roads. Uh, you saw the center, but look, the spokes going out from Pueblo Alto. Now, on the left side below, you'll see a road in, uh, uh, from Bluff, Utah. Have people been there? Probably. And that goes 15 miles across, basically, to a shrine. Um, and here, another far outlying site. That's what they look like when you're in just the right moment of the raking light at dawn or sunset. Not nearly enough uh, to be able to detect all the roads, and that's why we need Rich's help. So I'm just going to say how we got on to a certain perspective of the roads. The North Road, you can see there, goes to Coots Canyon, and I worked with Mike Marshall, who's a fantastic archaeologist, and we worked about seven, eight years together in the field. And we went, well, this is just to tell you how wide and to give you the sense of scale. They're typically 30 feet wide and very straight, as you've seen. And when we followed the North Road, um, it goes up these cliffs. All of, many of these um, different spokes are headed up to Alto. And then from Alto, they, well, here they go up that high cliff. And at Alto, they go off in these spokes and they eventually join um, up there and cross the Escobada Wash and then go 35 miles north. Um, and you've seen this in the Mystery Chaco Canyon, but they drop down this Coots Canyon with a very, they chose the steepest edge. They actually diverted by a, a, a degree and a half off of directly north to have the steepest edge. And that's where Mike Marshall found the broken pots and the stairway. So we knew that something was happening there that was not utilitarian. And also along the road, there's no signs of encampment, which is another indication that they were not used for trade and transport, or at least this road, at least this long section of that road, 35 miles. And then to the south, we have Hosta Butte, which was the next thing we found. And that's thir exactly 35 miles south. And that's where that road goes, which is extraordinary because you um, go from Kenya'a, which is near Crown Point, and then you go up that cliff, um, very steep, and the, you're following the shards. You're following these pieces like Hansel and Gretel, and you're covered with pinon and juniper until you come to the edge, which we can't show you here, but there's a little shrine, which is typical of the roads. And from there, you see the sweep across to Hosta Butte. So you have the, the north being the place of um, emergence, according to, let's see if we have that quote from, oh, and parallel routes, which I think Rich will show you more. Um, but the, the extraordinary investment, 30 feet wide, parallel routes for some parts of it. Um, and this was extremely important to learn from the Pueblo people, their understanding of roads. And sometimes the Navajo people would talk in a very similar way, that these are, symbolic trajectories. These are, in this case, with the North Road connecting with the world below, return of the spirits. And Ed Ladd, who for years worked here in the uh, anthropology lab, he also um, gave us this interview and, and expressed that view. So the roads are extremely important for the Pueblo culture, for the Chaco culture, and for the Pueblo culture. There's so much symbolism in the Pueblo culture. And I'll just end by giving you a quote from Alfonso Ortiz, whose daughter Elena is here. Um, Alfonso said to me, you should know that the translation for road in the Tewa language is channel for the life's breath. And I think that is a beautiful summary of what we were learning. Um, slowly but surely. And now the question is how to, how to preserve these roads, how to understand the extent of them, and this is where Rich is going to take you on a journey on roads. <laughs> Let's put this right here. <clears throat> well, thank you. Uh, thank, thank everyone for coming in tonight, and uh, thank SAR for, for giving us time, and Anna for giving me precious time tonight to do as well. And I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, also thank John Stein, who I worked with for many years, uh, and it was his mentorship and uh, support that uh, without, I'm sure I would not be in front of you tonight. 
how it worked. Oh, it's like it when technology works, I feel better. <laughs> Especially since I'm supposed to be the one doing it. Uh, so this is, this is your, your typical great house landscape. Uh, this is Padilla Well, it's actually in Chaco Canyon National Monument, but, or Chaco Culture National Historic Park, excuse me. That is a, a Benito phase, or a classic Chaco and great house. And, and then these mounds, these earthworks, encircle it or partially encircle a great house. And then when you've got breaks in those earthworks are where the roads enter or exit the great house, depending on, on which you know, orientation you're, you're into. In this case, this 30 foot wide road comes across the landscape. It's uh, quite well built, uh, one of those that Typically, uh, I've been accused of using the force to, to see the roads. This one you could trip over, so it's not too tough. Uh, but it's also connected to this great kiva with a, a small little uh, side, side ramp, whatever. There's a gate in it. Those are just features. We have no other language to call them. We just call them gates. They're just little tiny structures that might be a foot high at most that intrude onto the road and, and leave an opening. And then we've got this road that goes across. This is a later building. It is not contemporary with that great house or with this great kiva, but they are connected with a road. That's an example. There, there are a few of these around where you've got roads connecting through time. Uh, John Stein likes to call them, them uh, umbilicals through time, where you're connecting two, two features that are not contemporary in time, but yet you're you're connecting the essence of one with the other. And then road rooms are, are pretty similar. Uh, road boxes or shrines. Often shrines are just little piles of rocks alongside the road. So they, they're pretty uh, difficult to see sometimes and not, not real exciting. Uh, we often think of roads as being associated with you know, the classic Chaco period. They actually start around 650 AD. Uh, about the time you start seeing the great pit, pit structures, and in, in, uh, it would be in, in Basket Maker three times that you start seeing roads associated with those. And this is the Newcomb Great House and, and the Newcomb community. This is just an example of how complex it can be. That's the Great House. You can see all the roads coming off, and now we're going into the community. And notice the roads don't stop, and in fact, they concentrate in locations in the community. So while, while we think of them being fairly simple, they really aren't. They're, they're extremely complex. Now I'll talk about uh, some of the technology. This is a, an image created from LiDAR data. LiDAR is, is literally points in space like you see here. And you can see this road coming across. This is Penasco Blanco. And also photogrammetry. Uh, I'll show work done like this, where I've gone out with a pole with a camera on the end, and, and uh, that's my aerial photography. <laughs> Cheap, but effective. And, and you can also use, use drones for this as well, but uh, what I'll be showing was done the hard way. However, first we'll look at, uh, this is the Aztec Mesa Road, or Aztec Airport Mesa Road, near Aztec. You can see the, you know, that two-horse buggy. It's not, it's not necessarily small. This road is 60 feet or 20 meters across. It's large, like two two two-lane highways large. Uh, and you can see the white there. It had at, at one time some sort of sur surface treatment on it. That's why it's so obvious. That's the same road in 2009. Can you see it? I can, but I use the force, no. I, I looked for it for years in aerial photography, I couldn't find it, until I got 1930s aerial photography, and by golly, there it was. However, LiDAR is, is a, this incredible tool because you can create a surface of the Earth with it, and then you can use the computer to uh, change where light's coming from. So you can get an image like this where you can see the road coming up the side. Another LiDAR image with uh, this has got an aerial photo put on top of it. So the yellow lines are the parallel routes north of Pierre's on the North Road. 
Now we'll move down and you can watch those parallel routes. And another big thing about LiDAR is you can kind of enhance the, the uh, vertical exaggeration so you can see things like that. And now you can see the roads heading down toward Pierre's, which is right there. One of the, the things we'd wondered about for years is there are some sections of road that we know about that have been seen in aerial photography and that we can see here in, in this image, but you get out there on the ground, you can't see them. And of course, if you can't see them, you can't figure out why you can't see them. So in, in this section, I thought, well, LIDAR will work. Let's see what it looks like. So this is that section of road, 20 times vertical exaggeration. This is that same section of road with no vertical exaggeration. It's three inches of, of uh, relief from edge to center to edge. That's why you can't see it, three inches and 30 feet. It, it is not perceptible with your vision. And you couldn't go out in there and measure it with, with the equipment in this case. You couldn't take a total station out there or GPS because this is a sand surface. And as soon as you set your, your instrument down, you've already changed the elevation compared to three inches. Another location, uh, you can all see the road, right? <laughs> that pickup right there is right in the middle of it, that green one. That's where the road is. Actually, this road in, in the 80s was very clear and pretty easy to see. This was done in, uh, I think this was around 2010. So this is that same section of road in 2009. You, it's pretty hard to see. We're, we're looking at it right there. That's with LiDAR data. You can see it. And with, with uh, the, the pole aerial photography going out there, you can see the same thing. The difference here is the resolution is so much higher as I was trying to remove the vegetation, which you can, you can remove vegetation from, from the images. I was able to actually show those berms down in the bottoms where you don't see the road. The vegetation was slightly higher along the edge and I was able to pull out uh, two vegetation alignments on that road. Oops, got ahead of myself. I got a happy finger. So this is the North Road, Great North Road, that same location. I guess you could hear something if I turn the sound on. And it stopped. Technology's great when it works. <clears throat> So you can see it's pretty clear as it crosses, these are uh, quaternary dune deposits, sand dunes. Uh, and you can see here where, where the cattle and the game like to use the road as well. <laughs> and we've crossed the road. That's a full size pickup there for scale. Now think of moving that much dirt for 40 miles. That's quite an effort. And this is taken just before sundown so that you, we've got shadow enhancement of the road. Another uh, LiDAR image, those lines show where, where the par parallel routes are. And a curious thing is you can see the roads as, as they crest these dune features but as they go through the bottom, you, you don't see them. However, if you were to go out and use a GPS unit like uh, Peggy Gowdy and, and Jim Copeland did, and mark where every place you find a shard, or a shard, depending on how you want to pronounce it, you'll see in those low spots, they concentrate. Part of that is because there's, there's clays there that help push the shards up, or shards up to the top. Across the tops of the dunes, they sink down in the sand. Uh, people always talk about how roads are straight. That doesn't look too straight to me. 
Notice up here we got it. We've got a dashed line because when this map was made, they said oh, it might be up there, it might not. We don't know. There you can see it goes a little bit farther in this image. However, with lidar data, you can see the whole thing, and not only that, you can see that very clearly. And we use 1930s aerial photography a lot. You can see the same thing here, and you can see that straight road coming down. In the 30s again, Chaco, was, it was pretty easy to see the roads from aerial photography. This is 2009, uh, it's getting pretty difficult. So what's happening is, is over time the roads are disappearing. Uh, and from looking at it as a geologist or a geomorphologist, it's pretty easy to understand. It's called erosion and deposition. And every year you either get more erosion or more deposition. So if let's say we lose 10% of visibility every 100 years. Right now, we're in the last 10% of visibility on a lot of the roads, and a lot of them, we've already gone past that last 10%. So while we think, well, if, if we don't do anything, the roads will always be there, they may always be there, but our ability to find them won't. So that's looking at that same area. You couldn't see all those roads. That's the LiDAR data of Chaco. And there you can see the roads. And this is after that aerial photo was taken. So the, we can still pull those things out even though they're, they're beginning to disappear visibly in aerial photography. And this is a real good example with this little arrow that shows which way the light or the sun is coming from. In the real world, the sun rises in the east, sets in the west. That means shadow enhancement can only come from the east and the west. In the computer environment, we can, we can make the sun any direction we want, and we can enhance the roads. So you can see roads literally appear and disappear before your eyes based on the sun angle. So photogrammetry, that's a, another thing we're using, um, a new process. It's called structure from motion. I won't get into what that is. This is actually a great cue at the point site south of Farmington. And this is all done with photogrammetry or, or using photos to measure things so you can make a 3D model. And this is Pueblo Benito. So you can make these, these really cool computer models, but then you can also measure things and, and uh, make physical models as well. And when you do that, you, you have then can begin to give other people the ability to experience it without actually being there. And this is uh, what Anna talked about earlier, uh, threatening rock. So this is the major construction stages of Pueblo Benito. It starts off rather modest. So you can see the little figure there for scale. The first great kiva, these great kivas move counterclockwise through time. This area is where all the, the really impressive material culture came from. Stage two is beginning to look more like what we think of as a great house. The great, great Kiva there, the little, little person for scale. We have this hook feature here that shows up in the end of, of Pueblo Benito. And right here is, is where all that, the, uh, the important stuff was in, in Pueblo Benito. Stage three, notice the time frame here, not very long, a lot of construction going on. That's where the foundations were. We don't know exactly how high they were, when they were built, when they weren't, but uh, uh, Judd felt that was the same time frame they fit, so that's uh, what we did with the model. Now this will look a little more familiar. Stage four, the final great Kiva. This big foundation complex over here, if you go from the east corner of Pueblo Benito, southeast corner, to the southeast corner of the foundation complex, that's the same distance as from the southeast corner to the southwest corner. And the final construction stage is when they develop this, uh, for lack of a better term, this platform to address threatening rock. 
which it seems as if threatening rock was very important and why Pueblo Benito was where it was. And this is comparing recent, well, uh, what you can get commercially as far as uh, aerial photography with uh, structure from motion photography. So that's uh, Casa Cielo, it's one of the outliers. That's so you can see what it looks like. That's LiDAR data from the BLM. You can see uh, in 3D the light is higher than, and the dark is lower. That's the structure for motion photogrammetry. Not only can you see the walls, but you can map them. Or not photo, digital elevation model. This is the photogrammetry here. You can see quite clear, clearly the features. Also, you see this line, which is the edge of a road, and you can see how the texture right here is different than the texture on either side. That's how it, normally when we're out there, you, that, that's really hard to see. And, and when you see it, you go, well, I've used the forest once too much. It's really not there. But here you can actually see it. Now we'll zoom in and see what sort of detail we can get with this. If you're, if you're a geologist, you can map ripple marks on the sandstone. And there are some other things going on here. That's actually, looks like it's a winter solstice road. And going from corner to corner on the Kiva is also that same alignment. However, if you go the other way, from uh, there's this little structure that sits just outside of the building itself, and a gateway here. We've got the winter solstice sunrise. Of course, since we've got it in 3D, we can manipulate it and interact with it in 3D. So this is the 3D model. You can see the road here, where it comes through, the opening in the gate. Oh, yeah. The Kiva, as we move in here, there's that little platform or that little structure that sits just outside of, of the building. And it looks as if this was actually truncated. It's not a quarter, a, a square corner, but it has a flat spot across there. And some something built inside. When you're out there, you don't notice it because you, it's so big, but once you get it in the computer environment, you can interact with it in real time, you can see these things. And now as we zoom back out, you'll be able to see right down in this area, some parallel rocks right there. That's where a wall fell down, and what we're seeing is the edges of the rocks where it fell down. So we can, we can completely map this site now in, in the office, not in the field, which saves a lot of time. Uh, King Kletso, another 3D model, just an example of what you can do with this. So this is one person, me, creating a 3D model of King Kletso. And that's the map. The, the purpose here is to create that. Here we've got uh, Pueblo Benito. These are all at the same scale. Pueblo Benito with the little figure for scale. Chetroquetl, the same figure for scale. Pueblo Alto. Pueblo del Arroyo. And Quinclezo again. Of course, uh, we've, we've heard a lot about you know, oil and gas development. It is endangering sites. Uh, however, uh, and that's, you know, the area that within the Chaco Halo. But we can't forget about these other things. Um, we're, we're, we're losing sites and, and roads every day. We're losing the ability to see them every day. And, and just by stopping development doesn't protect them completely because once they go away, our, our ability to recognize them goes away. They virtually are, are no longer existent. Now it's back to Anna, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks Rich. Um, well, I'm so glad you can see the potential of what we are 
beginning to get into, and it's so exciting to make this so real to people. Um, and again, it's making it real so that people want to protect it and hold it as valuable. And we have this amazing paradox that it, that the extent to which Chaco still exists out there is that it is so remote and so subtle that people aren't drawn to it. But by the other token, that means that it's, it's gradually having this erosion and um, loss of features. But the technology has the hope. Anyway, I just want to end with, um, again, looking at the distances and, and the extent to the, co the cosmology reached across the landscape. Bears Ears is about 140, 150 miles from Chaco. And um, from a building that it, we will see here, this is Edge of Cedars. Maybe some of you have been there, 140 miles from Chaco. And the walls and the building are lined up to Bears Ears at Equinox. So from there you see the sun set in, the, in between the Bears Ears. Just the way we saw about 65 miles west, I mean east of there, Chimney Rock hold the moon. So this landscape that seems to people who want to develop and make some money out there, like a wasteland, is actually filled with meaning to the ancient people and to people today. This rugged set of um, spires and springs and, and caves all had alignments to, uh, often with roads or, or with astronomy. It is a web of sacred landscape and it calls for us to protect it, to understand it and protect it. So thank you, thank you so much. I think we could do two or three questions um, before we wrap. Uh, okay, you were, you were first, man. How were the roads created? You mentioned dirt was removed, and then wouldn't that have allowed water to then pond in some, even though it's very dry, and wouldn't vegetation have shown a line of it? <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and in some cases that's how we find them is because of that vegetation alignment. Uh, but they, they were constructed, and they were constructed pretty well to where the, the ponding wouldn't occur, they would drain, they, they did make them drain. Uh, the interesting thing is that, you know, they go to all this work to construct them, but yet they show very little use. And the dirt was very little compaction, yeah, the, the platy structure under the roads is, uh, you know, an inch maybe. Possibly so. It shows some some use, but that use could be literally just the people moving up and down the road, uh, going back and forth while they're creating them. How many uh, people worked on those roads, and also how many people worked on those buildings? I must have, missed, must have been thousands, and they, they did it every day. Not Questions we can't answer. Yeah, that's a that's a million dollar question there. <laughs> but, there but but maybe look, maybe it would help people to just think about. Sticks and baskets basically being what's, what was needed to do this. They didn't have our technology. Um, so the labor had to be very intense, especially with the roads, even more so maybe than with the buildings. And the number of roads is still a mystery. It's when we look at individual sites and we see so many spokes that we can assume that every building, not everyone that we have been able to map, but has these spokes of roads, and some longer, some shorter, but probably hundreds of miles, hundreds of roads. Yeah. I would say too, there's been, a, there have been estimates of how much time and people on building the great houses, but of course, that depends, you know, how many hours a day you assume people are working and how much people can work, and so those can vary pretty drastically. How many people worked on it? Well, how often were they working? How many hours? But that has never been done for the roads, and that's sort of estimates. But it might be in the works. I'll just uh, put that this out. Is in the works by him. <laughs> Any other questions? Or Why do you think it was important in their culture to have the roads form a straight line instead of taking the easy route, a 
around terrain features? That's such a great question. And, and when you see aerial photos, and, and I'm sure you know this, but of say a Navajo root, um, maybe 100 years old, it'll squiggle around because it's going around those obstacles. And I, I tried to emphasize how much they went the up and down. For the, there was an obsession with trying to create a vertical axis to their kingdom, like going down at Coots Canyon, going up at Hosta Butte. And any pinnacle that we see will usually have a road connecting with it. Um, so why is still a hard question, because it would have been so much more practical to go around, but they didn't do that. And they built stairways and rampways to make multiple routes going up. So I think it has a, oh, this is the word we've been using, cosmographic meaning, significance. Um, that you create on the landscape, sometimes an astronomical alignment, but also an alignment to something prominent in the landscape, something that has meaning as a sacred site. And that's your purpose. And that will mean in the desert, something that goes up, something that goes down. And maybe one last thing is that for the Pueblo culture, the straight road is often referred to. May your life be on a straight road. The road of the sun, the road of the moon, the road of daylight. These are straight roads, it's said, and sometimes parallel. Um, well, still mysterious. <laughs> How has the climate changed? Another good question. <laughs> About 30 different answers. Uh, if, you, if you look at the tree rings, uh, it, it hasn't changed much at all. In fact, from uh, 2000, around 2000, you go back 100 years looking at, at uh, tree rings and rainfall, it was actually drier then than it is now. But, but we do think that there was more small tree population in Chaco, that that was stripped away. But there were never large timbers that, um, what, 50 years ago, people thought there had to be in Chaco. Those had to be imported. One of the reasons that um, Rich is, has been saying that there's unlikely high population there is that there wasn't the, the uh, wood for fuel to heat you, to, to create uh, the food, to cook your food. And that would have been wiped out very quickly in a matter of a few years. That's something to consider about that choice of why there. I would say too that there's um Looking at those tree rings, by the width of them, we can see how dry or wet the year was. And there's, I mean, it's sort of counterintuitive. There's really dry times when building explodes. There's really wet periods where, so there's no clear, and this is sort of the story within Southwest archaeology more generally these days, that the idea that like climate is this single driver um, doesn't, doesn't fit with the data. So, um, but the beginning of Chaco, there's a lot of rainfall, and then, well, it's steady, but not any higher, not huge amounts. It's just more predictable at the very beginning. But that's the clearest pattern I can discern. Sorry to cut so, you off. So, um, the significance of the solstices um, can be understood agriculturally and seasonally to know where in the year we are. What about the uh, symbolism and significance of the lunar? Yes. Uh, you know, this nine-year cycle, why would that matter to them? What would be the symbolism there? Well, well, uh, sometimes I think we have to look at other cultures and mythologies um, around the world where you do see the sun and moon, Buddhist culture, Hindu culture, um, Islamic culture. Uh, we ourselves have Easter, a uh, uh, synchronicity of the sun and the moon is in that. Um, so, and for Pueblo culture, it's emphatically true, especially for the Zuni, that Shalako is set as a um, synchronization of the of this winter solstice with the full moon. So the moon bringing it together, and in their stories, there are stories of when they pass each other, there's a marriage, or the sister and the brother, the sun and the moon come together. Um, how can I be in that world a thousand years ago and tell you what that is? All I can do is show you the effort they made just to take chimney rock to build on that precipice 
a building and, and time it to exactly when that moon would rise between the, the rocks is an extraordinary statement of how important it was. And now, I, I can't exactly prove it, but I do think that trajectory of the canyon and the placement of uh, Penasco Blanco to face down there on the perpendicular to that moonrise does suggest that their engagement with the sun and the moon was a good motivation for their development in Chaco. And we see now in Mesoamerica that there was a great deal of involvement with the moon as well. Let me just add a little fact that helps you understand how important Penasco is, almost as important as Benito. And they are the two crescent buildings. The back wall of uh, that crescent of Penasco has 29 rooms. And in the trajectory down the canyon, you come to Casa Rinconada, which has 28 niches. That's the lunar month. So um, anyway, I got carried away. <laughs> sorry. The moon, the moon. I'm sorry. But, but it's just so evident it was important. And, not, and as you say, not for practical purposes, but symbolic. Why don't we end at this point? The, the more we know, the more questions we, we want to ask. Um, we may have some, some seats available for the discussion tomorrow at SAR, but you should check with members of staff on our way out. But please join me in thanking uh, Anna.